Politics of Food, which is an interdisciplinary talk here as well for this semester. It um, uh, gives me great pleasure to introduce today's talk by Carrie Privish in the Sociology and Anthropology Department, Global Lane of the Local Food Movement's Blind Spot. I also wanted to let you know about our next talk in the series, which is Wednesday, October 20th, and that will be Adam Snade and Alexander Legogo from uh, Geography and Political Science and they're speaking on food security perspectives in Central Africa. That's Wednesday, October 30th in this room. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Harry Privish. Well, thank you, Monique, for this opportunity to present my research and more importantly, for your interest in including labor issues uh, within your seminar series on the ethics and politics of food. And thank you to all of you who came out on a Wednesday afternoon. It's great to see um, so many faces uh, that I haven't seen in a long, well, to see so many faces first, and then also to see a lot of faces that I haven't seen for a while because I've uh, just spent the past year uh, in the UK. Uh, so af after spending that year in the UK, I must say it's, it's really good to be here. Fall is a beautiful time in Canada. Uh, the changing autumn leaves, the harvest moons and those surprising sunny days that warm up the crispest of mornings motivate many of us to make the most of the season before the cold weather hits. So this is a time to head to the farmer's market, to buy the last of the summer bounty. I'm counting on tomatoes. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that there's some left. Uh, to take children apple picking, to pick up a pumpkin pie at one of those on-farm uh, country markets, or maybe stop at the side of the road to get one of those autumnal-hued chrysanthemums to decorate our porches. But it's perhaps this time of year and these fall products and experiences, perhaps like no others, that bring us closest to agricultural production in Canada. Indeed, for some of us, it is the only time of the year when we set foot on a farm. At Thanksgiving, it's also the time that we're most likely to thank a farmer, if not uh, in spoken prayer, but in our minds as we carve up that corn-fed organic turkey or tuck into the pumpkin pie. What many Canadians don't know is that the supply of these local harvest time products that I mentioned, apples, pumpkin pies, and chrysanthemums, depend on the labor power of tens of thousands of non-citizen migrants from over 70 nations in the world, who form part of the 338,000 migrant workers currently residing in the country. The, these men and women are largely missing from the local food narrative that we embrace in the harvest season. In fact, farm workers in general, including those holding Canadian citizenship, are absent from the local food narrative. This local food narrative manufactures nostalgic images of food production in Canada, one in which farming is presented as a sanitized, almost romantic activity carried out by white people. The latest Foodland, Ontar the latest Foodland Ontario ad, still reproducing the good things grow in Ontario jingle, begins with children running through a field past an idyllic red brick farmhouse to the white producers who lovingly place immaculate food products on a silver assembly line that ribbons its way through gilded pastures to consumers in the supermarkets, including a little girl that embodies multiculturalism and symbolizes the most desirable immigrant pro profile, middle class and educated. And I think I'm going to be able to show that to you. So let's just try it. Oh, of course. <laughs> I always think when it's plugged in, it, it shouldn't ask us to do this, but. So now it should work. <coughs> okay. 
It's closer than you think. It's down the road. Or around the corner. It's a short walk from where you are right now. It's fresh. It's local. Oh, it took us back to the beginning, but that's okay. Closer to home, here in Guelph, in the Guelph Mercury, the current ad being run by Borealis Grill features, features one of their chefs kneeling in a pristine carrot field, gently easing the soil from freshly harvested carrots, likely to be placed next to the others so artfully displayed in the basket at his knee. It's also their Facebook profile um, or cover page, so I, there's a wider screenshot of it. But in both these advertisements, the nature of food production in Canada is portrayed as small scale, artisanal, and almost noble activity. Farm workers are completely absent. Indeed, this local food narrative contributes heavily to the invisibility of farm workers, in particular racialized migrant farm workers from the global south. That Canadians know little about migrant workers is hardly surprising. There is a long history of government and industry efforts to invisibilize the growing globalization of the labor force sustaining agriculture and food production in Canada. Moreover, the work regimes in which migrant workers are embedded are such that they have little time to integrate in dominant society, and their residences are far from where most Canadians live. But another part of the reason, suggested by the title of my talk, is that consumers, foodies, the food movement, and even academics who study food have shown little interest in the workers who sustain the food system. Indeed, local food and its preparation have been fetishized of late. And as Patricia Allen writes, quote, localization has been held up as an ideal and a solution to the environmental, social, and economic issues in the food system, end quote. While the hands that produce this food have largely been ignored. Well, most of the hands, particularly the brown and black ones. The white ones, the ones belonging to the farmer or the chef, often male, are part of the local food narrative. The narrative in which farmers are our heroes, chefs are celebrities, and locally oriented shops such as Mark McEwen have become tourist destinations. And indeed, when my sister was here from Vancouver this summer, the top thing on her list of things to do was to go to uh, Mark McEwen's Don Mills shop. So in my talk today, I hope to shed light on the labour force sustaining local food production in Canada, first by exposing its globalised character and how that came to be. Secondly, I will explore how temporary migration programmes limit migrants' rights and the exercise of the rights they do have. And third, discuss the labour regimes that such programmes enable. And finally, I will examine the absence of labor and immigration issues in alternative food initiatives and academia. And it's hoped that this discussion will take food movements, consumers and academics to task for their fetishizing of food and its consumption and veneration of localization while paying relatively little attention or no attention at all to the men and women farm workers and their families who sustain <coughs> agriculture and food production in Canada. So I'm going to focus on migrant workers. <coughs> and when I use that term in that, this presentation, I'm referring to what the government calls temporary foreign workers. People working in Canada on temporary employment authorization and with temporary <coughs> visas for entry and residence. Of course, there's other components of the agricultural workforce who migrate to work in agriculture. 
including permanent resident and citizen newcomers, often living, living in suburbia, who are transported to the fields um, and greenhouses by contractors or gang masters. Mennonites with dual citizenship who migrate <laughs> from Mexico transnationally to take up seasonal work in Canada. Canadians who migrate from Aboriginal reserves and disadvantaged provinces, as well as a growing group comprised of illegalized workers, largely visa overstayers <coughs> or refugee claimants that are under deportation orders. So when I speak of migrant workers today, I'm just focusing on that group holding temporary employment authorization, what the government refers to as foreign workers. The RBC scandal last year, which it actually even made it into the UK news, in which one of the firm's suppliers had Canadian workers uh, train the migrant workers who were due to replace them, was fortunate. I don't mean to suggest the fact that 45 people lost their positions. Well, eventually, they didn't lose them entirely. They were reassigned in the company. That part isn't fortunate. But, it's th but the timing of, 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 of um, the scandal was fortunate. It took a group of white-collared workers to be on the receiving end of the problems inherent in the temporary foreign worker program to focus the country's attention on growing numbers of migrant workers and uh, the problematic nature of the temporary foreign worker program. In 2011, some 300,000 migrant workers entered Canada a figure that represents a tripling in migrant entries since 2000. And in this graph, I've got entries of all tempor temporary residents, but migrant workers are in the red. And this one represents the numbers of temporary residents present in Canada. And what both these graphs do from um, CIC is indicate a significant shift in Canadian immigration policy whereby numbers of new permanent residents have declined alongside rising numbers of migrants on temporary employment authorization. Forty years ago in this country, the majority of people who were entering uh, to work shared the same rights as, um, most of the same rights as Canadian citizens. By 1993, they had become the minority. So seven, in, in, and by 1993, 70% of people um, entering, um, were, were ent entering Canada uh, to work were on temporary, temporary employment authorization with a much narrower set of rights and much reduced ability to exercise the rights that they were granted. So the balance has shifted tremendously. If we just look at jobs in agriculture, which is really a, a subsample of food system workers. In 2011, Canada approved more than 35,000 positions for migrants. And I'll talk about these little programs, th these different programs as we go on. The incorporation of racialized workers with less than full citizenship has a long history in Canada, but it was in the 1960s that the government institutionalized this practice through formal guest worker programs. In 1966, the Canadian government signed a bilateral agreement with Jamaica to bring in 264 men to Ontario farms to fill seasonal uh, shortages in agriculture. And that agreement formed the first of five that was signed with a number of Caribbean countries and in 1974 with Mexico. This set of agreements is now known collectively as the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program. And this program allows employers of on-farm primary agriculture to hire migrants from Mexico or one of the 11 Caribbean par partner countries on temporary contracts that last anywhere from six weeks to a maximum of eight months and according to negotiated wage rates. Over the past five decades, the SOP has extended from its genesis in the orchards and tobacco fields of Ontario to now operate um, in all but one Canadian province and the three territories. And it now approves close to 30,000 positions annually. 
as you can appreciate in this graph, um, there's a number of blips there, but the, the, the upwards trend um, you know, shows how the, how, the, how the program's growth really sped up in the late 1990s with the growing globalization of the Canadian food system. Over the years, the definition of primary agriculture has also changed. Um, so we see this definition of what is primary agriculture uh, changing from year in year, and most recently to include animal production. So prior to, so the, the, the SOP begins in 1966. Prior to 2002, SOP participants from Mexico or one of the 11 countries in the Caribbean comprised the vast majority of non-citizen workers in agriculture. And this changed with the introduction of a new guest worker program in 2002, the Low Skilled Workers Pilot Project, which I'm going to talk about today as the pilot. And it has been rebranded several times. So it's now on its third name. Uh, and it's now called the Stream for Lower Skilled Occupations. But I'm going to talk, talk about it today uh, as the pilot. So the pilot is this federal initiative to expand temporary labor, labor migration in Canada, um, temporary labor migration to Canada, of workers that are designated as low skilled in any sector. So it is open to any employer who is approved to hire migrants from ab abroad. And it really came as a policy response to increasing employer demand for migrants created by the expansion of the Canadian economy in the first half of the 2000s, particularly in construction and energy. But rather than replace long-standing guest worker programs like the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program, the pilot operates alongside them. So it allows approved employers in any sector or any commodity to request temporary visa workers to fill low-skilled jobs, including you know, for agriculture and um, food industry work. And so the launch of this new program widened the pool of agricultural and food industries that were able to access uh, migrants. Some of the first to join were greenhouse growers um, and mushroom plants, and they had formerly been excluded from the SOP because the nature of their production was not seasonal. So, you know, this program now gave this wider range of um, uh, employers uh, in those industries um, the ability to, to access migrants. So as the SOP was widening geographically um, and grew over the 90s and the 2000s, the pilot widened the pool of employers and the number of migrant workers in agriculture. And at last count, the pilot was adding an additional 9,000 workers to the agricultural workforce annually. But perhaps you know, even more striking than increases in migrant employment has been the rapid diversification of the non-citizen labor force in agriculture. So as I mentioned, you know, prior to the pilot, almost all non-citizen labor, uh, farm labor uh, in Canada was from one of these SOP bilateral, you know, these SOP migrant sending countries, so 12 altogether. And in 2002, the first year of the pilot, migrants from an out astounding 52 different countries took up jobs in agriculture and food processing. And by 2007, that number had grown to 75. Who knows what it is right now? Um, th th this is, isn't data that's um, available on the CIC website as far as I know. So this graph uh, indicates the top eight countries of origin for migrants issued work permits for employment in agri-food occupations um, from the, the period 2002 to 2007. And it illustrates how migrants working in Canada's agri-food industries from countries outside of the SOP now rival those of the SOP bilateral partners. So for example, you kind of have to, the top is at the bottom uh, of that list along the the legend. Um, but Thailand and Philippines emerge in fifth and sixth places among countries supplying food and, and um, farm and food industry workers. 
ahead of these long-time bilateral SOP partners like Barbados or the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States. Most spectacular has been the incorporation of Guatemalan workers, a country that in five years was sending the largest number of migrants to Canada after Mexico and Jamaica. And almost all of this employment has taken place in Quebec, where Guatemalans have replaced Mexicans as the preferred labor force. This next graph that I have illustrates the number of migrants in Quebec and New Brunswick. And the reason New Brunswick is on there because that's how the data is collected um, uh, uh, administratively, but the numbers from New Brunswick are, are very marginal. So most of this growth is happening in Quebec. From 2003, the first year that Guatemalans were employed in Quebec under the pilot, to 2011, their numbers have increased 16 times to reach 3,654. And over the same period, the numbers of uh, Mexican and Caribbean workers employed remain stable. So, you know, overall, the migrant component of the agricultural workforce has both grown but also diversified. In Ontario, two out of three agricultural workers are seasonal or, or temporary migrants. Um, but we don't have a lot of uh, data to really estimate what the migrant component of the size of the migrant component of the workforce. But research indicates that migrant worker um, numbers have grown within the context of de decreasing employment for citizen workers. And uh, research with agri-food employers has also shown that migrant workers are considered crucial to their business strategies and to the industry overall. Why the increasing globalization of Canada's agricultural workforce is of concern is how these programs limit workers' rights and their exercise, and in turn enable labor regimes that are not possible with a citizen labor force. In general, temporary migration programs use immigration and citizenship policies to position migrants in a distinct category to permanent residents and citizen workers, and to legalize their differential access to rights and their exercise. And so I'm now going to turn and talk about some of these features of these temporary migration programs through which that is achieved. And I don't have time, it's a big list, and I don't have time to go uh, through all of them, but perhaps if people have questions then we can talk about those in, in the discussion period. So first off, all migrants are issued closed work permits. So they're only authorized to work for the specific employer that's named in their work permit. So rather than getting you know, authorization to work in Canada or authorization to work in agriculture uh, or even uh, you know, authorization to work in strawberries, these people are given work permits that are only valid with Farmer Brown or Old MacDonald. And it's for this reason that uh, many critics consider migrant farm workers as unfree labor because they don't enjoy labor mobility. And some have even suggested that they're even less free than undocumented workers who can vote with their feet um, if they don't like the employment um, practices at their work site. And these closed work permits really accord employers tremendous power in the employment relationship, whereby dismissal essentially results in deportation. Most migrants find out that they've lost their job when their travel arrangements um, home have already been arranged. And individuals have uh, been fired for refusing unsafe work, becoming or arriving pregnant, for questioning their employer, or for their behavior outside work. Being injured or ill is also grounds for losing your job and thus your right to work in Canada. And, uh, you know, as I was uh, preparing this job talk, uh, and uh, um, preparing this talk for you, not a job talk, but preparing this talk for you yesterday. <laughs> I like my job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> maybe. But as I was preparing this talk yesterday, I, you know, I get a phone call from a worker who I don't know. You know, my business cards are floating out there in the migrant community. Um, and I get a call from a worker who is worried that he's going to be fired because he's been injured. And um, he's, he's quite certain that his employers are going to be deported. Um, now, I get one call like that probably um, two or three times a year, but there's people in the room who are um, advocates and work alongside migrant workers that I'm sure probably get those calls a lot more frequently than I do. People in need of hospitalization or ongoing medical care due to injuries they've sustained on the job are often deported after a brief sort of fix-it-up visit to the ER and denied their access to workers' compensation. And overall, you know, deportability is a feature of life in Canada for migrant workers. In general, you know, migrants that are fired are deported. There are no practically workable mechanisms to change employers, and there's no scope to appeal wrongful dismissal. Within the SOP, uh, if you look historically, deportation rates are actually quite small. But you know, even though these um, rates of deportation are quite small, the threat of deportation constitutes a powerful disciplinary mechanism. As one Mexican migrant um, man um, said, then the bosses say either it's A or B. You put up with it or we send you to Mexico. So they don't give us anything more than yes or no. You leave or you stay. You work whether you're fine or you're ill. For this reason, we prefer to shut up and do what we came for, to work. We can't say anything because if we do, we're sent to our country. In addition to closed work permits, migrants' mobility is often constrained by the fact that many of them live on the premises of their employer. Because the employer provides housing, and workers in the pilot uh, also pay rent, this accords employers additional control and surveillance over their workforce. While some employers um, provide migrants with bicycles or even vans um, to allow them greater social mobility, um, you know, I, I, there, there, there are a number of, uh, of employers that, that take these measures so their migrant workers can um, move around. Others restrict migrants' mobility by withholding their identity documents, uh, installing curfews um, through threats, or even uh, by prohibiting um, the entry of visitors. As this woman said, the employers took our passports and other documents that we should have. The boss's daughter gave them back to us as we entered the airport. I don't know what her fear was, that I would stay in Canada or that I would denounce what was happening. We also have some great photographs that my research team has gathered over the years. Um, this one, um, prohibiting the entry of male visitors, uh, or this one, uh, that also has a curfew. And, uh, you know, this uh, one Guatemalan man speaking about uh, the migrant women uh, at his farm. The women don't go to church, they don't go shopping, they don't go anywhere because if the boss sees them, she threatens them. She told them if she sees anyone there um, at the church, she would send them back to Guatemala immediately. And in fact, this um, spring I interviewed a migrant worker that worked at that farm and indeed was not asked back uh, precisely because um, she went to the church um, against this employer's wishes. Migrants under these programs enter as single applicants. Their families are not given visas to accompany them, so they can't rely on the supports that physically proximate family members um, provide. Despite the fact that migrants in the SOP have um, uh, accumulated decades of work in Canada, sometimes more months, spending more months in this country than they spend in their communities of origin, there's no pathway of earned residence uh, linked to either program. Another feature of these uh, programs is forced rotation. So in order to participate in subsequent years, they must return to their countries um, at the end of their contracts. Um, and in some countries, report to the Ministry of Labour a week after uh, their contracts end. 
Uh, for pilot migrants, once they've accumulated four years of work in Canada, they're ineligible to come back to work in Canada for a subsequent four. The programs also contain a number of additional coercive mechanisms. So for example, rather than, you know, when employers go to, to hire workers, rather than, you know, say I need uh, 20 workers and have 20 workers sent to them, uh, the program, you know, based on the qualifications <coughs> for the position in question, the programs enable employers to choose workers on the basis of source, country, and gender. And the forms they actually fill out for the SOP has a little box where they put, you know, what nationality, what country they want to send them with workers. And so an employer might choose to hire um, 100 uh, English-speaking Jamaicans to work on the fruit orchard and 25 Spanish-speaking women to work uh, in the packing house. And some employers even go further, asking, to rec you know, asking recruiters to crest workers of a particular height or a particular uh, weight. So the fact that you know, formal and informal discrimination is built into the very architecture of Canada's temporary employment programs enables employers to foster competition between workers. And, you know, one way that this is done is that migrants are routinely threatened that they're going to be replaced with um, migrants from another country. Uh, this uh, migrant advocate who also worked in a greenhouse at one time said, in the greenhouse where I worked, the employer boosted his productivity by using constant fear. He told the workers, the Mexicans are coming, the Mexicans are arriving soon. These are the Canadian workers, actually. If you don't work fast, you'll be replaced by a Mexican. This is intentional. So all the workers were imagining that the Mexican men were all young, strong, and very quick. Then the Mexicans came, short, fat, some between 40 and 50 years old. The Punjabi women said, but weren't they supposed to be all young and tall? <laughs> Um, the fact that employers can um, choose workers by nationality and gender and sometimes um, other bases of social difference also creates competition between migrant sending countries to deliver these ideal workers that employers are seeking. And this ad that featured in a farming magazine was paid for by the Honduran government. And I don't know if you can see that up there, but the ad promotes their nationals as motivated to do what is needed, focused on quality and with experience in hard work. And at the very uh, corner there, there's also a 1-800 number that can be used to report workers who are not meeting expectations 24-7, 365 days of the week. And the ad promises that um, in the case of contract default uh, by the worker, a replacement worker will be flown in at the cost of the Honduran people from the 2011 budget. The ways in which these programs restrict migrant rights and the exercise of, of rights enable particular labor regimes that are not possible with a citizen labor force. For example, they involve long antisocial shifts that are accepted by migrants who are far from their families, who are eager to earn Canadian wages, but who are also unable to refuse unreasonable work schedules. Uh, one survey that uh, I carried out, part of a larger project with Gerardo and Otero in British Columbia in 2007 and 2008, found that Mexican workers were working 12, on average in, in periods of peak production, were working 12 hours a day, Monday to Friday, uh, Eight, on average, eight hours on both Saturday and Sunday, and then getting up on Monday to you know, do that 12-hour shift again. So an average of 76 hours a week. And as one David, one Mexican migrant put it, my employer has only been requesting Mexican workers for three years. He used to work with Hindus, how um, some of the Mexican migrants refer to um, Canadians, Punjabi-speaking Canadians. He used to work with Hindus. 
Now that he sees that Mexicans can work, he says that Hindus are useless. It's because at three or four o'clock, they get up and leave. He doesn't demand more hours, but with us, he demands we work 12 hours. Temporary migration programs also provide employers with a captive labor force that will accept variable employment. So one of the big, you know, I'm talking about these long um, schedules, but one of the biggest problems with the pilot has been underemployment, whereby employers hire too many workers and who are then underemployed. And this is difficult for migrants uh, psychologically. They're separated from their family. They're sitting in their bunkhouse, uh, bored and stressed because they're not able to send remittances home. And my research has heard a number of cases of migrants who were even going without food, practically starving themselves so that they could um, have money to send home uh, to their families. Some employers require workers to be available 24-7. So uh, migrants are literally chained to the work site. Uh, they can't uh, you know, go to the grocery store, they can't go out um, to the bar, they can't come over to my house for dinner because they need to be in the house um, waiting for uh, that call, that the call from the employer that may come at, at any time. And just a couple of quotes on variable employment. Juan, a Guatemalan migrant, said, the worst is that there is no work. They bring in many migrants and there is no work. There are days that they give me many hours, up to 14, and days that they leave me resting at home. They exploit me one day and the other. And then another woman says, we did not receive our first check for more than a month after we arrived because of underemployment. It was a terrible experience for me. We went hungry and so did our families. And in fact, it was connecting with Canadians um, outside the farm that actually connected these workers to uh, a food bank. The work is very variable according to a commodity. So there's, there's a lot of uh, difference in the type of, of a wide range of work that migrant workers are doing. But it's generally physically strenuous and it can take place under a range of climactic conditions. So, you know, hot greenhouses, um, killed, uh, uh, ch chilled kill floors, um, or even, you know, um, outdoors um, in, in rain-soaked British Columbia. And agricultural work is among the most dangerous occupations in Canada, but it's also the least protected. So while all farm workers are more vulnerable um, than most workers in other occupations, migrants face specific concerns. Uh, fear of losing their, um, you know, maybe even losing hours or losing their jobs means that migrants uh, work when they're ill and injured and fail to disclose health concerns to their employers. And there are a number of um, uh, reports out that have been done both in Ontario and Quebec that have surveyed uh, migrant workers and um, so I can have that available for people who are interested. But in general, migrants fear that any sign of illness or injury will result either in their, their deportation or the failure for the employer to recall them the following year. As one woman said, another coworker had a pain in his stomach at midday and asked to return to the house because his stomach hurt. The boss didn't request him again the following year because he said that the coworker resembled the Canadians with days that they wanted to work and days that they didn't. So he was of no use to them. So more often than not, migrants' economic need for their Canadian wages, together with the coercive mechanisms that are built into these programs, really result in their acquiescence to the working or living conditions that they are presented with. And in most of the research done on these programs, acquiescence is, is a major, major theme. There is considerable evidence in Canada and internationally that the use of migrant workers has allowed growers in high income countries to achieve the flexibility that is more and more demanded by the globalized neoliberal food system. Um, and this flexibility is achieved through a variety of employment practices 
including some of those that I've mentioned today, such as being able to retain a workforce despite a variable schedule and new mechanisms of control that have intensified the workplace and extracted greater productivity. There's also some evidence that the use of migrant workers have depressed wage levels in agriculture. And I have a quote by a human resource manager in BC that said, you know, prior to the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program, well, I was paying 15, 16 an hour to Canadians, and you know, these, me these guys, the Mexicans, get eight to nine, and they're worth double that. But that's the Canadian minimum wage, which is stipulated in the program, so we go on that. There's also an evidence that the incorporation of migrants has tr transformed the wage structure um, of occupations entirely. For example, jobs like mushroom picking that formerly paid peace rates to citizen workers. Those are now paying hourly rates to migrant workers, but still achieving the same yields. Um, so migrant workers are still being um, held to the same productivity targets and maybe even surpassing them um, that citizen workers achieved, you know, being incentivized by uh, higher salaries. Um, but you know, they're, they're getting those um, productivity, meeting those productivity targets through these um, mechanisms of labor control uh, that I've discussed. And I think there's a whole thesis in just looking at um, the technologies also involved in, in labor control. <laughs> So, you know, given the labor regimes that I have described, it's unsurprising that migrant workers do not figure in the local food narrative dispensed by industry and government in their marketing efforts. But more surprising is the fact that labor issues are only weakly addressed, if at all, in discussions of a sustainable food system. When Michael Pollan and uh, Sarah, El Sarah Elton spoke to a packed uh, house here in Guelph some weeks ago as part of the Eden Mills Festival, neither, neither of the speakers, the moderator, or those lucky few people <laughs> who um, gave comments or questions had anything to say about the labor conditions of farm and food industry workers locally or globally. In general, workers, labor rights, immigration issues are missing from the alternative food movement. As Patricia Allen, you know, writing about California has argued, workers as actors and justice as principle are missing in both theory and practice of alternative agri-food consumer, um, consumer efforts. Kirsten Cole, in her analysis of sustainable food and agricultural initiatives in the GTA, argues that, quote, when it comes to education and advocacy, few sustainable food initiatives shed light on the fact that migrant workers even exist. And she does cite a couple of exceptions. Uh, uh, Local Food Plus, for example, certifies businesses, including food producers, as local and sustainable according to a number of criteria, and one of those is safe and fair working conditions for on-farm labor. But the scope of this certification is very modest. I downloaded um, um, the, the um, growers and food processors that are certified. They're all lumped together, and there's only 84 on the list. Uh, in the U.S., there's the Agricultural Justice Project um, that has been working on establishing social justice standards for the food system. And there's also a domestic fair trade working group that has proposed a food labeling system. But overall, local food movements in Canada and the U.S. have engaged very marginally with labor and immigration issues. While local food and direct marketing campaigns prioritize supporting farmers, for example, other food system workers are largely invisible. And this maintains ideologies of agrarianism, in which farming is given moral and economic primacy over other occupations and livelihoods. And also, 
the agricultural excep exceptionalism that's been used to deny farm workers the same um, set of labor rights that most workers enjoy. Today, you know, 2013, in Ontario, farm workers, migrant and uh, citizen farm workers, continue to be denied the right to form unions and collectively bargain. And it was only six years ago that the provincial government included farm workers in the Occupational Health and Safety Act. The privileging of farmers over food system workers by the local food movement thus reifies power across relationships of race, ethnicity, citizenship, and class. A number of scholars have also problematized this whole veneration of localization at the expense of a more complex understanding of the political economy of food. For example, some critics have worked hard to um, dismiss the conflation of local uh, and organic with justice. So Julie Guthman, who's written um, on, the, on the, the capitalization of organic production in California, for example, has argued that part of the reason that local has achieved such prominence in food politics is the failure of organic agriculture to address social justice issues. The silence within the alternative food movement around labor and also immigration is issues may also indicate an assumption that local communities and local farmers embody social justice rather than any proof that they do. Another example you know, that could be a whole talk is how the veneration of localization um, rests on shaky imperial, empirical grounds is the whole concept of food, mo food miles, which tells us that purchasing a tomato grown in an Ontario greenhouse that's heated by subsidized natural gas and produced and harvested by a migrant flown in from Thailand <laughs> is greener than one produced in Mexico by a Mexican and air freighted in a commercial jet from Cancun carrying, you know, Canadian snowbirds um, that have been, you know, holidaying. Or that, you know, the sugar snap peas that we buy from an on-farm market that we drove to in our SUV are more sustainable than those air freighted um, from Guatemala that are produced by a small farmer whose probably extended family's carbon footprint is still smaller than the producer who, producers who grew them. The absence of labor issues within the local movement is also reflected in academic scholarship of global agri-food systems. Uh, ben Selwyn at the University of Sussex, um, you know, some of his work argues that global commodity chain, global value chain, and global production uh, network frameworks that really dominate thinking about uh, global agri-food systems, and that's four globals in one sentence, have paid more attention, you know, have paid insufficient attention to work and workers. Uh, more recently, scholarship in the area of, of social upgrading has tried to bring uh, more attention to bear on labor and workers. But overall, the impact of changes under globalization on work process and labor um, and the living conditions of, of food and farm industry workers remains understudied and under theorized. And again, you know, I think there is an independent study opportunity in just doing a content analysis of all the abstracts submitted to the Rural Sociology Society or the Agricul American Agricultural Economics Association, you know, to see which ones deal with farmers and which ones deal with farm workers. So what does this mean for the ethics and politics of food? And where do we go from here? First, if social actors within alternative food movements want to extend their conce conceptualization of sustainability to include social justice and avoid reproducing the existing social privileges that they often embody, then perhaps it's time to recognize the local and fair dichotomy 
as false as Kevin Morgan has suggested and rather incorporate both local slash green and global slash fair within food sy systems so that we extend our responsibility of care globally beyond our localities. Uh, similarly, as, as noted earlier, organic and fair cannot be assumed. And uncoupling these dichotomies is part of Patricia Allen's call to local food movements to combat these entrenched ideologies, um, such as agrarianism, and I would um, add nationalism, in order to work towards social justice. Improving the situation of migrant and citizen farm workers in Canada depends on expanding their access to rights and expanding their enjoyment of rights. And in order to move this agenda forward, alternative initiatives for a sustainable food system can work together with movements for migrant and farm worker rights. Over the past uh, decade and uh, almost a half, there has been uh, a social movement that has coalesced around um, advancing migrant work rights, um, including agricultural and food industry workers. And it includes a number of organizations and activists working across Canada at the community, provincial, um, federal, and even global levels. And some of those people are, are in this room. Engaging with these social actors will undoubtedly push alternative food, food movements to a more critical, inclusive understanding of the contemporary political economy and capitalist social relations. And further, push us beyond our fixation on consumer choice to a realization that working with social movements to change legislation is critical to achieving justice. While the local food movement should be celebrated for what it has achieved so far in promoting our education of how localities are imbricated in a globalized capitalist market and also supporting alternatives to industrialized agriculture, we must encourage act the actors within it to adjust their rear view mirrors to include workers and labor and immigration issues within this moral economy of food bending our understanding of sustainable towards a broader vision of social justice and the historical inequalities that have defined our food system. And I think that there's a lot more things that we can add to this list, but we can um, do that in the discussion period. I just had one as someone went out that, you know, she just congratulated me for making every employer of um, migrant workers look like an ogre. Um, maybe someone else shares her view. I actually do share her view. Uh, I am a former employer in the program. Uh, and, but I don't disagree with what you've said here today. Uh, I think you've brought up some very true comments and exposed some needs. Um, however, I agree that it's human nature. There are some excellent employers out there, and there are some terrible employers. I met both during my years as an employer. And I think, I mean, you kind of, uh, you've expressed the need for legislation, which I disagree with. Um, at the same time, I think there's a tremendous need for education, um, and you can say for the general public and for everybody else, but for employers. Because mm -hmm. many of these employers, uh, as I saw, jumped into this program because they're running a business, they need somebody to do the work, they're struggling, and so here's an option, great, we'll do it. They have no cross-cultural experience, they have no language experience, many of them have poor managerial skills with people, uh, particularly with another culture. So it's not that they essentially set out to, I'm gonna take advantage of these workers, it's just they do not have the skills and experience. So I, I think there's a tremendous need for Frankly, I think every employer should have to take a course before they can be an employer uh, in one of those programs uh, to make them aware of all aspects of it. You know, understanding other cultures, understanding other languages. Uh, you know, I, I think that that's a huge need and it should be a requirement. I 
coached hockey for 15 years, and every second or third year, you have to take a course on, on harassment, on this and on that. And yet, here's an employer running large businesses, and they've had no training to do that. Well, thanks so much for your comments and you know, um, um, and and uh, putting forth that uh, your your own experience. Uh, I think that um, you know what I tried to do in the talk was talk about how these programs enable labor regimes because you do see uh, such a spectrum of employment practices. So you have the employers that I said that you know, uh, give their employees a vehicle and make sure that someone has a driver's license and, uh, you know, take them to get signed up for um, their uh, provincial health insurance, for example, uh, who, you know, give them separate rooms and um, computers and Skype. But then on the other end, you know, you have terrible exploitation. But, you know, part of the reason that this, um, you know, range exists, I agree, is human nature. But as part of it, you know, what I've tried to argue in the talk is programs that provide the scope for that to uh, occur. And I think that one of the other points that you made that I think is really important is thinking about, you know, really creatively how to improve co compliance. Because certainly farmers that, um, uh, who have good employment practices are really concerned about how the growers with bad um, employment practices are really affecting their livelihoods. So thank you very much for your, your comments. Eduardo. Um, just to connect to that comment, um, I work for the Occupational Health Clinics for Ontario Workers, and we run um, satellite clinics for migrant workers around occupational health. And we have a program that we extend to employers who go on to, to be invited. We, we can't really, we don't, we're not enforcement, so we can't arrive at the farm, we have to be invited, but um, to have us go and, and do run workshops in Spanish um, or in English or in Thai um, around occupational health. And it's tricky because out of, I think we did cold calls and mail outs and all around southern, southwestern Ontario. And I think right now we're working with Penn Farms. Uh, we've gotten, you know, hang ups and things like that. So I, I really, I think, you know, it's, it's great. I, I echo, you know, your comments about potentially it having to be mandatory um, be, because just from their own interest, we find that a lot of employees don't want to work with us. And we're not, you know, we're, as, as when I wear it, Okay, I'm very neutral in my politics when I work, so we definitely don't engage with them in any way that, you know, that makes them think that we're trying to unionize or anything like that. It's just offering, and our services are completely free, actually. Um, so, and the funny thing, too, is that the employers that we do work with, um, who are on the spectrum of the better conditions, who are doing things that, they're, that would seem like good employer relations, employer-employee relations, um, when we ask them whether we can put them on our website, we can name their farms as best practices, they always say no. And there seems to be a culture in a lot of the farming community that we engage with that even the ones that are doing it right don't want to stand up and talk about doing it right because then they initiate kind of reverberations amongst employers that are doing it wrong and they don't want to have their neighbors or their, because these are such small communities, right, where people know each other. And so that's a huge barrier that we're encountering is that there's not, no advocates. And, and like Harry said, then there's also structural things to the program that even at the best employer employee relationships are still very inherent in problems within the program as well. So it's kind of twofold, but. And this is Eduardo Huesca, an MA student in sociology, as, l as well as working for OCAF. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and a really excellent question because, you know, when I give a presentation, uh, you know, I'm not trying, I mean, I am not trying to do what that young woman um, accused me of, of demonizing producers uh, because there are, you know, these are um, food chains in which power is distributed at, at different levels. And so I talked a lot about, you know, the, the you know, relationship of power between um, workers and that employer named on their work permit. Um, but, you know, of course, the, the big players are the supermarkets. 
and um, that um, you know the supermarkets who control a lot of what our, how our food system uh, looks like. And so these are um, global players uh, that control a lot of the food market in Canada that are setting um, uh, the rules and, and setting the prices. Uh, there is a lot of um, uh, uh, price competition in Canada, um, um, much more so than in other countries, for sure. But um, but the supermarkets are, you know, some of the, le you know, they're leading the direction of, of where the food system is going. Uh, there's a number of other things, you know, I'm sort of uh, simplifying it uh, quite a bit now. But you also see, um, I mean, if you if you look at how horticultural horticulture in Canada has has just changed, and um, you know there have been you know when I talk about the globalization, you know it's also neoliberal policy change in the Canadian food system, and you know of course the trend towards um, you know to survive you have to uh, be big, and you have to invest you know make these heavy capital investments in your farm. So we've seen the number of farms uh, shrink. We've seen you know smaller farms having to get a niche in order to uh, survive, and. Um, you know, a lot of, um, you know, people are also under a lot of pressures because of the capital investments that they've made. But the global, you know, how producers have done in Canada is, you know, a mixed picture because uh, Canadian horticulture has really benefited, um, you know, if you look at the figures, uh, you know, has really benefited under globalization. So some commodities have suffered and other commodities have expanded. Um, uh, you know, you, take, you go into um, uh, Leamington and, you know, these greenhouses, they, I mean, I would like to see aerial shots from, you know, 20 years ago to uh, 10 years ago to five years ago to even three years ago. I mean, they can't get them up fast enough. So there are people that are benefiting from the way our foods, you know, the, the, how things have changed in Canada, but there have also been losers. Did you want to add anything to that? No? Okay. <laughs> or anyone else? <laughs> just, just the other driver at the farm level, of course, is just getting the to show up. Um, and so, yeah, you could say, well, it's economics because if you were paying $15 an hour, people would show up, but maybe they wouldn't. Um, it's very difficult to work, and some of the seasonal aspects of, of horticulture mean that holiday Mondays sometimes. Uh, just to speak to what you said, uh, we farm as well. We have a uh, hardy market garden. Uh, we have farms with 200 acres, uh, as well as we have dairy and beef production. And uh, for a market garden, that's the hardest thing that we have to find is consistent workers. We can't find Canadian people that want to do it, right? And that's the thing. We need someone that's going to show up every day and predictable. Uh, we, I mean, 76 hours work a week. I think I put in more than that because I just smell the cows. Uh, cows cab at two in the morning, one in the morning. I, we still got to go there to deliver the calf. We can't just, you know, oh well, we're not going to go there and the calf dies because that investment we put in to breed the cow, to carry the, the pregnancy for nine months, and then have a calf. We need a live calf on the ground at the end of the day, right, to perpetuate that business moving forward. So you, you know, you, you work schedules around it. Um, but we we, put, we uh, hire seven uh, people, and these seven migrant workers have been on our farm for the last. Uh, 15 years, the same ones keep coming back because we give them a good place uh, to live. We take them to social events. We're close to the city uh, so that they can go do what they want. We give them days off. Uh, to speak with what you said, uh, there is a movement with uh, A more than ever, which is uh, a farm credit Canada has heard out. And uh, farmers are very humble and we don't have time. Nothing against that. But we're very busy running this businesses and we don't have time to, to, to go that way. But they do want us to become more aggravate. Uh, and go out and talk about those things, but realize that that our time is worth something too in running, running the business. Uh, there is money moving forward, the Growing Forward 2 uh, project put out by the federal government as well as the Ontario <coughs> government, and uh, we can capitalize on some of those as farmers as investments for uh, having migrant workers. Uh, we might be expanding to about 12 to 15, but we can't uh, send them to the neighbors because the contract says I can't send them to the neighbors. 
right? Even though we, we usually have enough work, but if we take home less credit than we want, we could send them there. But we do give our, our, our workers uh, tools, and we, we, we do put uh, um, farm tours together for them to see different things. Uh, we do a lot of our stuff with radio frequency tags. So they have a little thing that they just uh, slide at the end of a row for like tomatoes or whatever. So we know, we can, we can monitor from our computer of which rows have been picked and which rows haven't been picked. And we can do it all from a computer. I can tell you exactly where all the trucks are. I can tell you where all the people are throughout the business because you might need a fight an issue. But there's lots of technology out there. And the technology uh, that we're uh, coming is actually taking away jobs from migrant workers. Uh, so if we, we got three robots, uh, we don't need workers to uh, smell cows anymore. The robots will do it. One of the, uh, when you were speaking, you know, and also one of the, you know, disappearing species of diversified farms in, in Canada. Um, but as you were speaking, um, you know, it, it reminded me of one of the most eloquent, uh, um, you know, arguments that a migrant worker said against the closed work permits because he said, you know, if we had open work permits, the employers that have good labor practices would have people queuing out the door. Um, they would not have, have issues, and the employers with poor labor practices and accommodations would have to pull up their socks in order to retain their, their, their workforce. And the other thing, you know, we only see this one country, right? We either have Mexicans or we have Jamaicans, and we don't take both because they fight, and they fight because they're fighting for the same money and the same work, so then we won't get anything done, right? Um, so we only hire one or the other, and th there's a reason for that. Um, I see a number of questions there, so I'm just going to open this mic for one. Oh, do you have any? Yes? Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, maybe about him, and I know a little bit about it, but uh, you have a lot more about it, thank you today, but we'll talk, talk some more about it. Uh, uh, is it just the role of agents or brokers in it, right? So, I mean, I know with, with Jamaican workers, they don't just have, they don't enter into an immediate contract with the farmer, right? There's somebody brokering or there's an intermediary in that relationship. And what do we know about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, under the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program, because it was a bilateral program, government to government program, uh, recruitment was carried out by ministries of labor. And it continues to, and those ministries of labor continue to be involved with uh, recruitment. And, you know, that was one model, and there's things that are problematic about um, that model. But what happened with the pilot program was that uh, because it's just a unilateral piece of immigration policy that lets a approved employers hire workers from any country of the world, uh, that recruitment piece got taken out. So overnight, this industry of agents um, you know, came out of the woodwork. And uh, people have paid between uh, you know, 3000 to, I think the most I ever heard was $15,000 to get a job in Canada under the pilot program. And those, um, so the government puts this program in place, takes the recruitment piece out, and does nothing to regulate it. So that, um, you know, some of the other uh, presentations that I've done have talked about the ways in which the pilot program has really grown uh, the illegalized workforce in Canada. Because, you know, people paying let's say $10,000 for a job in agriculture, they come to Canada, they realize there's no way in my contract length that I'm gonna make up that money that I mortgage my farm in Thailand to pay for. So they, you know, skip out of their contract, they leave their employer and find work um, underground. So, the, um, so there, you know, there have been steps made to try and regulate recruitment but it, this hasn't been like a federal initiative, it's been led by the provinces. So Manitoba uh, came up with the Worker Recruitment and Protection Act, and that um, all employers of migrant workers have to register with the provincial government because it's a federal government, so um, by registering, the province knows who's employing um, uh, temporary workers and all the agents have to, the labor contractors also have to be registered. They pay a bond so that if something happens, there's a, f a fund to which, you know, to compensate uh, people from. And, you know, another, you know, a number of provinces are starting to do their own initiatives, but we still don't have um, something at the, the federal level, you know, a concrete workable piece of legislation at, at, the, work at the federal level. There is um, this blacklist 
that uh, employers who you know, violate conditions of the contract um, uh, can be put up on this uh, blacklist, but it remains empty, despite the fact that um, people like the uh, Alberta Federation of Labor, they know how many um, complaints have gotten in and how many um, employers were found to be in violation, yet this blacklist remains empty, unless that's changed. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I think what, you know, if I speak from a migrant worker's perspective, migrant workers, you know, it's not necessary, it's not that they necessarily want um, legislation around hours, but they want to feel that they have the power to say, I don't want to work uh, 76 hours a week, thank you very much, uh, when they're getting uh, too tired or, um, um, but I think a really good example in point is when UFCW, uh, you know, one of, well, the first uh, contract at Mayfair Farms in Manitoba that involved uh, uh, temporary visa workers and citizen workers, and there was a piece in there about overtime, and the temporary foreign worker said, well, we're not signing it, because if overtime is part of our jobs, the employer won't pay us overtime. They'll just bring in another migrant worker to pick up those hours. And we're not interested in 40 hours a, a week. Uh, so they ended up you know, changing the contract to, you, know, you could have an option, um, you could choose. So citizen workers who have family members who have social responsibilities within uh, Canada you know, opted for the overtime and migrant workers, um, I don't know, perhaps not all of them did. But you know, from a migrant's perspective, it's the ability to say, I don't want to work um, tonight, or I don't want to work 76 hours, or I do need a day off, which they currently don't have. It, it was actually the other way around. They, they, signed, uh, they signed and voted for a contract that allowed them up to 76 hours a week. Um, after the 76 hours a week, they would get a, a dollar increase, and the employer refused to pay anything over 76 dollars or 76 hours, so uh, they got no work more than 76 hours because the farmer refused to pay the extra dollar. Mm -hmm. But the contract has the two options, is that? No, no, there, um, uh, uh, anyone could work up to the 76 hours. Anyone worked over and beyond that got the dollar an hour bonus, mm -hmm. and the farmer refused to pay anyone the bonus time, and so the workers got mad and actually decertified the union because they weren't getting more than the 76 hours a week. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, um, Dan. My question is in regards to preventative, so you know um, workers' um, attitudes towards sending money back home change as a result of all these tensions that you talked about, such as you know, um, competition amongst workers and threat of, threat of deportation. So How does that affect the money that they sent home? Yeah, like, do their attitudes change towards sending money back home once they come here and have been working for a few months? Well, you know, generalizing, uh, you know, most people are here because they want to send remittances home. And, you know, that's not speaking uh, for all of them, but, you know, generalizing, you know, that is the driver for them spending um, you know, up to eight months or maybe even two years under the pilot away from their families and their loved ones. So remittances is the big driver. And you know, this is why people will acquiesce to all sorts of um, conditions 
in order to be able to um, access those Canadian wages and send it home. And you know, one of the things that I, that I didn't mention today about the diversification, you know, I talked about how the diversification of the workforce um, you know, breeds competition and allows, um, you know, breeds more competition amongst um, workers and also uh, sending countries. But it also allows more vulnerable workers, um, you know, brings more vulnerable workers into the labor force. So for example, people from Thailand who have spent you know, $10,000 to a recruiter to get their job. And also, you know, from countries from, you know, Guatemala, the difference, if you look at the human development indicators from Guatemala to Mexico, and, um, you know, the, the material conditions of the Guatemalan workers' families is so different, you know, from, uh, you know, there's, there's poverty in Mexico, but not to the extent that there is in Guatemala. So, um, you know, those workers are even more, um, um, vulnerable than, than, than some of the um, other nationalities uh, working under these programs. And, you know, that, that really is the driver. I mean, some people, you know, don't send as many remittances home because they establish, um, you know, more of a social network here in Canada and, um, you know, may over time send, send fewer remittances home. But um, by and large, you know, people, um, working on average for about six months in Canada spend, uh, send about $6,000 home. I, w I think I'm going to ask the last question. If that's okay, okay, sure. <laughs> uh, are there examples of other high-income countries that have gone another way on this, that, that have better legislation and higher wages for migrant workers, but in which the local war or local food movement has survived, that local farms have survived? Because I'm thinking, you know, one of the most common rebuttals you hear to the kind of argument you presented is, well, lo you know, local farms couldn't be, wouldn't be sustainable without, uh, without these pressures on these, you know, the, the pressures on, on the wages of migrant workers without, um, uh, without paying them half the, uh, the wages of Canadian workers. But I wonder if a comparative view uh, with other high-income countries might, you know, might be one way out. Uh, yeah, do I? I don't know of like a good model. Ironically, the Canadian model is usually held up as the shining international, you know, model of best practice. I mean, in, in Spain, uh, you know, one thing about they bring mostly um, North Africans in to, to work, and uh, that program actually has a path for earned residence. Mm -hmm. So that's very different to the, the Canadian program. Uh, the UK, I mean, the UK has a program that, uh, you know, I think if, if, if uh, Canadian growers saw it, they would laugh because it's so, um, it, you know, it, it, it does not have the same uh, perks from a grower's perspective that the Canadian program has because it, um, it's mostly educated, uh, you know, students who are paying for their tuition that are, um, involved in that program. But most of the migration into the UK is, is people from Eastern Europe. And they've seen uh, similar problems with uh, gang masters. And in fact, have, um, to the extent that when those uh, cock cockle pickers were drowned in Morecambe Bay, came up with a special legislation around labor contractors. Uh, no, I don't know of a, a good example, but I'm going to uh, continue to look for one. The Australian New Zealand programs were modeled after Canada's. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for a very compelling presentation. Thank you.